Hello, and welcome to History 1102. This is week two, the lecture for Friday, January 31st, on the scientific revolution, a continuation of, of what we discussed on Wednesday. Last time, we were discussing <clears throat> the scientific revolution and the awesome uh, results of the, of the scientific revolution, and how it has shaped every aspect of our lives over the last four to five hundred years. Uh, we examined how it has basically allowed human beings an unprecedented understanding of the natural world and given us the tools to manipulate that natural world to serve our interests uh, and to improve our lives. But what I want to talk about now for uh, briefly is that in some ways, and we talked about the contribution of Sir Francis Bacon with his Novum Organum, the science, you know, kind of outlining for the first time the scientific method. We talked about Isaac Newton's great contributions of uh, the idea that there, there, there are universal laws that apply in all places at all times, both in the heavens and on earth, and that the language to understand this natural world is the language of numbers, of mathematics. But this idea of scientific progress, we have to kind of put it into a larger perspective. Um, the scientific process, a measure of procedure that has characterized natural science since the 17th century, consisting of systematic observation, measurement and experiment, and the formulation, testing, and modification of hypotheses. Um, this scientific method, while in some ways is new to the scientific revolution, it's also just kind of part of humanity's thinking since the uh, cognitive revolution of 75,000 years ago. But what I mean by that is, in various ways, people have instinctively done the scientific uh, process, the scientific method, uh, through much of human history. If you think about, for example, the domestication of plants, um, as an example, uh, what is it, but not, what is it a process of, but observing what's going on in the natural world, manipulating it, seeing the results of that manipulation, and then uh, uh, doing, uh, and then and sort of analyzing that, and then using that to further manipulate a natural plant in order to get it to produce more of what you want, fruit, vegetable, whatever it is. In, in fact, the scientific method is actually about something much bigger. It involves more than merely silence, science, but economics and po economics and politics as well. It involves an entirely different mindset for people to have, the belief that we can progress. And we talked about this a little bit on Wednesday, this fundamental attitude that people in the world of the 21st century believe, but that was something new in the scientific revolution. So again, if we go back to the world of 1500, people did not necessarily believe in the idea of progress back then. Yes, you had schools and you had learning and you had funding for schools and learning. You had government backing for schools and learning to a very limited extent. But it was all to confirm what was already known. That was the difference. To legitimize how things were supposed to be and had always been. When a king gave money to a school, he did not expect it to produce new medications or weapons or to make the economy grow. But since the scientific revolution of the past 500 years, humans have come to believe that by investing in scientific research, that by investing in scientific research, in learning, in, in, in discovering new things, we can increase, increase our capabilities. And this has not been based merely on faith. It keeps proving itself to be true and reinforcing itself. Governments and wealthy individuals and in more recent centuries, corporations invest in something, say research into electricity and then electrical generation. And this produces enormous profits and enormous returns on that investment, taxes, profits, depending on which institution is sponsoring uh, the scientific research taxes if it's a government, profits if it's a corporation or an individual, which are then invested in better electrical generation, and so on. So how did that transformation from accepting things as they are to believing we could change things through research occur? Again, humans have been curious about how the universe works since the cognitive revolution. We've looked up in the sky and wondered how things work and, and why the stars are in the sky and all that kind of thing. That just seems to be part of human nature. And we put a great deal of time into figuring it out. Think of the Greeks or the Buddhists who explored all kinds of ideas about how the universe worked and how uh, various forces in the universe worked. 
So what then is different about the scientific revolution? And it begins, as we've discussed before, with the idea of ignorance. Uh, the idea of uh, accepting the idea that we don't know. Uh, the term ignoramus, for example, comes from the Latin for we don't know. When we call somebody an ignoramus, we are assuming that they are you know, stupid and, and unknowledgeable. Um, and that's where the idea, that's where the term we don't know that, or ignoramus comes from. It literally means we don't know. So it begins with the idea that we don't know everything, that, that what we, the knowledge that we have is not the extent of all knowledge that there exists. The second aspect of what makes the scientific revolution unique is the centrality of observation uh, and mathematics. These are the two contributions, of course, of, of Bacon's Novum Organum, the importance of trusting one's senses and, and using one's senses to go at the truth. And then, of course, uh, Sir Isaac Newton's um, uh, you know, contribution that all the natural world can be understood in terms of mathematics. So admitting ignorance and then seeking new knowledge gathering observation and making theories. The Greeks, ancient Greeks did this, of course. Uh, Aristotle and others did this. But the difference with the scientific revolution is that it is based now on mathematical tools, and, and those mathematical tools allow the, the creation of complex theories that are, in fact, tied to the real world. The Greeks oftentimes just hypothesized about things, kind of created those romances that we talked about on Wednesday, you know, sort of did some observations and then elaborated these complicated theories that bore no relationship to reality. With the scientific revolution and the use of mathematics, now you could anchor those, those, those theoretical ideas that you came up with and tie them to the real uh, uh, observational data that you got through senses and through various scientific instruments that you develop to enhance the senses, things like the microscope or the telescope. And then there was the idea of the third part of it was develop is using those new theories in order to the, creating these new theories in order to use them to acquire new powers, most especially to develop new technologies that would in fact allow you to see more and to understand more, um, as well as to get greater uh, command over. Uh, the natural world and over the environment. So in a sense, what the scientific revolution is really about is not so much a revolution about knowledge. It's a revolution away from ignorance. It's a revolution of, it is based on the very idea that we are ignorant and we can learn more, that we can understand more. But it starts with that uh, recognition, that acceptance of ignorance. For, for if we take the pre-scientific revolution traditions of knowledge, wherever they are in the world, whether it be Christian or Confucianism in China, whether they be Muslim in the Arab world, whether it be Buddhism in East Asia, um, they were all based on the idea that everything that is important is already known. We talked about this before. They're, they've come from the gods. They come from God the singular god of the monotheistic face of the West. They come from wise people of the ancients like Aristotle. And this knowledge was then written down, and you consulted these texts and traditions. It was basically inconceivable to people that the Vedas, the, the, the scripture of, of Hindus, or the Bible, or the Quran, uh, the, the two great holy books of the great monotheistic religions of the West, had missed out on important questions about creation and the natural world. It was just inconceivable for people to believe that those books did not lay out everything that needed to be known, or that these secrets that were out there that were not explained in scripture, that they could be understood and comprehended and discovered by ordinary human beings. You know, in these holy books was all knowledge that human beings ever needed to know and would ever know. That was the pre-scientific uh, revolution idea and understanding of the natural world. And so, these, tra two tra these traditions, these pre-scientific revolution traditions of knowledge of the natural world, <clears throat> only admitted to two different kinds of ignorance. Individual ignorance. If a person wanted to know about how the human race started, he assumed it was in the Bible and a priest would answer that for him. Collective ignorance was explained that it didn't really matter. If a person asked why, for example, if a person asked why things fell to the ground rather than up, and the explanation was not in the scriptures, it was assumed not that the scriptures were deficient, that there was something missing from the scriptures. What was assumed was that if God had wanted us to know why things fell down and not up, he would have put them in there. And since he didn't, you didn't need to know them. Now, Christianity and other religions did not forbid inquiry. 
There were some who looked into things, like why things fell down and not up, but they were peripheral to, to society in general. Anything that they might have learned was considered unimportant because, again, it wasn't in Scripture. And there were some who argued the Scriptures were deficient, but they were typically marginalized or persecuted. Take Muhammad in, 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 in the Islamic tradition. Muhammad, um, when he first began preaching the revelations that he that Muslims believe that he received from God or Allah, um, Muhammad said, you know, kind of went out into the world, went out to Mecca, told the people of Mecca that their pre-Islamic beliefs were completely wrong and that he had come up with a new truth about the world, a new truth about creation. And, of course, once Islam got established, it became the new orthodoxy, and anybody who questioned it uh, was questioning this new orthodoxy. And then eventually what happened in the Islamic world, uh, even though after a great deal of flowering of science in the Middle Ages, eventually the kind of the door to new knowledge shut in the Islamic world, um, as it already had in the Christian world. And it was a, the idea came that all knowledge uh, was already revealed in Scripture, and there was no need to search for new... <laughs> But the scientific revolution proposes something different, or people who scientists propose something different in terms of uh, ignorance. So, for example, when when Charles Darwin came up with his theory of evolution in the middle of the nineteenth century and wrote it down in the Origin of Species, Charles Darwin didn't argue that I have come up with the absolute truth about the evolution of life and and how life evolves and and my explanation of the sheer diversity of of creation. And all the different species and how they've changed and explanation of the fossil. He didn't sort of say, okay, I've come up with all knowledge. This is everything you need to know, and we do not need to know further inquiry. Charles Darwin would have been the first to admit that his theory was just that. It was a theory. It was based on uh, uh, extensive observation of the real world, uh, of fossils and of living plants and living animals, but that it was easy, that it could be and should be modified if new facts emerged, new facts that contradicted what he said. He would simply, ex he would have uh, readily accepted that. That's what sort of makes it different than pre scientific revolution ideas and understanding of the natural world and the universe, which kind of fix it in dogma and say, this is what is, it is, and it's usually with a supernatural origin, as we talked about, and therefore it cannot be questioned, and there's nothing more to know, and we're done. But as we know, so that's one aspect of what makes the scientific revolution different, that this acceptance of the idea that the current theory is only as good as the facts and observations and experimentation that it is based on, that if something comes along to challenge it, we change it. But another idea is that the admission, the continuing admission within the scientific tradition within the, sci the, the tradition developed first in the scientific revolution, not only that you know, theories that have been developed may change due to new kinds of observations and new facts, new experimentation. But that the acceptance that we really simply don't know certain things. For example, you know, physicists will readily accept the idea or will readily admit to the idea that we don't know what preceded the Big Bang. We, we have no idea. And so there's this sort of acceptance, A, that we just don't know certain things, and that perhaps we, we can with better instrumentation, better theory. Um, but again, it's that acceptance of ignorance. That's what's so important. We don't know, for example, uh, biologists and those who study the human brain will readily admit that we, while we understand, we've learned quite a bit about the brain, consciousness, um, awareness of our own existence um, is something that we have not figured out where that comes from and how that operates within the human brain. It is still a mystery. Now, science doesn't say, well, it's unknowable. We can never know it because it hasn't been revealed already. They will simply say they will admit that we have ignorance, which, of course, spurs on the quest for new knowledge. It's never closed off. And that constant belief that we can understand more, we can gain a greater understanding of the universe and, we can, and, and the natural world, and that they, we can then create from that theory and from those ideas and from that observation and scientific experimentation, we can gain greater mastery over the uh, over the natural world and manipulate it to our benefit. That continues to move on and on and on through this idea of progress that is embedded in the scientific revolution. And we know from the scientific revolution, and we know from the history of, of, of how the scientific revolution has proceeded, 
that there are that new paradigms develop. So there are old ideas that sort of large theories that explain things. For example, uh, one can take the the concept of plate tectonics that that uh, continents sort of float around the world on on enormous currents of magma within the mantle of the earth beneath the crust and that our current continental formations around the world are merely are, are the product of these tectonic movements uh, it was only discovered in 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 the 19, early 1980s by a team a father and son team named Lewis and Walter Alvarez studying various geological uh, uh, strata within the earth and came up with this theory and it sort of demolished the old theory that continents have been fixed forever in where they are today. And as new evidence has emerged to prove that this paradigm, this larger theory of, uh, of, of plate tectonics, of the movement of, of the various plates uh, that, can, that make up the crust of the earth, as that developed, as those facts backed it up, that paradigm became more, more and more established and is now the paradigm that all geologists accept. But if somehow, and highly unlikely, but if somehow new facts emerged, of course, we would dispense with this new paradigm and transfer to a new one, similar to the asteroids killing off the dinosaurs. This was a, a discovery of the last 30 or 40 years, the discovery that this is the cause of why the giant reptiles largely disappeared from the face of the earth and allowed mammals uh, to take their place at the uh, sort of as the dominant uh, vertebrate life form on earth. And we've come to accept that in this new paradigm. But if again, if other facts and ideas come forward, people will dispense with it. Now, this admission of ignorance, this acceptance that we don't know everything, um, is what makes science so powerful. And it, it, it's what makes it so dynamic and so flexible. But that admission of ignorance also presents a problem for the modern world. And the problem that it presents for the modern world is that the old absolute truths, as, as written down in, in scripture, for example, written down in the various religious traditions, of the world that provided people with a certain with a sense of certainty a, a truth that always was and always will be uh, the new ignorant you know the scientific revolution argues that you know that there is much ignorance out there that we don't know everything uh, that we can't assume anything is the final answer that everything is kind of tentative and, and evolving and changing and that this is applied to the and, and so this idea is very unsettling for lots of people. Um, if, if it's applied to the dogmatic truths of the world, dogmatic truths of religion, uh, that God, man, for example, is created in God's image, it can, it can make for a very unsettling experience for lots of people in the modern world because science sort of says, well, nothing is really certain. Everything is, there's always a possibility of change. Uh, scientific theory, you know, is, is, is very unsettling because it, it, it says there's lots of stuff we don't know. And even what we do know may not be the absolute truth. And human beings have responded to this kind of uncertainty, particularly in the, 20th, in the 19th and 20th centuries in, in modern times, as science has become kind of the preeminent way in which we understand the universe and the natural world, and even to a certain extent with the social sciences, how human society works. And there's been sort of two general responses uh, to this uncertainty that science has brought. One is through uh, ideologies. Um, for example, if we take communism, something we'll be talking about later in the course, and we'll actually examine it a little bit next week when we talk about capitalism, the idea, uh, as we'll, we'll see next week, that you know, all of human history is defined by conflicts between classes and that and that human societies progress because of these the, this constant conflict of of classes or Nazi theories that that all of human history can be explained by competition between the races and some races are superior to others. Um, these two ideas, what, what happened, what, what people have done is they've taken these ideologies, they've claimed to anchor them in science, class conflict communist race theory in 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 the in 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 nazi in nazi ideology and claim that it that that this scientific truth was absolute and unchanging and so they they created an ideology to replace religion uh they claimed to base it on science but of course it was absolute it was a refutation of science because science always argues that no this isn't the absolute truth and the absolute way of things but the nazis claimed it was for race theory the Marxists claimed, the communists claimed it was for class theory, but in fact, 
these weren't based on science because they weren't based on the very scientific idea that this isn't the absolute truth. The other, the other way human beings respond to the uncertainty and unsettlingness of modern science is to do sort of what we have done in the West and what we have done in the United States. That is, uh, an admission of ignorance destroys old belief systems and a sense of certainty. That's what we talked about. That's the problem that science brings up. And so what people have done in the West, and for example, in the United States, is we've developed a non-scientific truth that we've declared as absolute truth. And that, for example, is in, as in the case of liberal humanism and the importance of the individual. We've developed this idea, this doctrine that says, that believes in that every single person is unique, every single person has unique rights and, 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 and has value, and this is really uh, the basis of our civilization. But as we're going to talk about, we get to the Enlightenment later and to the revolutionary periods of the French Revolution and, and, and the American Revolution and other revolutions. Uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries, we're going to real, we're going to come to the understanding that this idea that human beings are born free and equal and all should be equal in front of the law, while it's a wonderful idea, it's not based on any kind of science. So, so it's a it's a non scientific absolute truth that humanity has developed um, as a response to the uncertainties of science. But we'll get into that more later on in the semester. But the bottom line for now, for our discussion now, is that modern culture has been willing to accept ignorance to an amazing degree, more than any other culture in human history. But that's partly because we have put an almost religious belief in technology and scientific research. Um, in other words, our faith in science, our belief in science, our absolute certainty that it brings progress and brings change for the better. Um, it's in, in itself, science has, has replaced our belief in absolute truths. We've come to have an absolute belief in science in much of the world today, um, even though that science itself undermines certainty and truth, because it's always questioning things. But the very process is something we've come to believe in and, and made into something that we believe is an absolute good and an absolute part of our being as human beings, that, that this is part of what it is to be a human being is to is to accept science and to accept the scientific method and accept the scientific idea that we can continue to uh, understand the universe and understand the natural world to greater and greater degrees and that we can then use that understanding to manipulate that world uh, to serve our interests. So as we've noted before, modern science has no dogma. Um, by definition, it is a principle or set of principles. You know, uh, excuse me, uh, modern science has no dogma. Uh, definition of dog, as we talked about, is a principle or set of principles laid down by an authority as incontrovertibly true, that it's an absolute truth, unchanging forever, and doesn't rely on scientific uh, evidence to prove it. Um, making empirical observations and putting them together using mathematical tools is what science is about. People throughout history have made empirical observations, but the importance is limited uh, as the idea that we already knew everything. But with the admission of ignorance, we found it necessary to look for completely new knowledge, to accept that when our observations contradicted existing theory, we toss out the theory. We study the old knowledge, but always with the understanding that we need to go beyond it. We've also, through Newton, came to the understanding and, through, and, and to a certain degree through uh, Sir Francis Bacon's observations that mere observation is not enough. You need to put it together into larger theories that explain what we are observing. Newton didn't say when he was in his garden, oh, you know, here in my garden, uh, my app, this apple falls from a tree, but he put it into, you know, and, and, and therefore gravity applies in my garden and my garden only. He put it into a larger theory. Now, how did he do that? Now, prior to the scientific revolution, civilizations typically put observations into theories based on stories, myths, and scripture. So, for example, if we tried to, you know, it, it, when, you, when you read the Bible or you read the Quran or you read the Vedas, the Hindu uh, the Hindu holy books, or anything, any of these sort of religious traditions, what you're reading basically is an expert, you know, when they do address uh, the natural world and humanity's place in the natural world and how the natural world works, or you even look at traditions in animist religions or, or whatever a tradition it is prior to the scientific revolution, the way things were understood was in storytelling. There, there were these these stories. This is, you know, creation happened because of this or, or, or why, you know, why are foxes, you know, or, or some animal, why are they the way they are? Why do they behave the way they do? It's because, you know, they would tell a story that explained it, that, you know, and 
and, and we, you know, we know these, for example, from Native American uh, myth-telling traditions or from the ancient Greek myths. There was always a story. That was the way people told things. And, of course, knew what Newton's great contribution to to um, to our understanding of the natural world was he changed that from storytelling to math. So, for example, when when Christians in the pre-scientific era came to came to examine, you know, why is the world the way it is? Well, we know it is a it was a story they told themselves, and of course they told themselves that this story came from God. Therefore, it's absolute truth, and we know that story from the Bible. We know the creation in six days, and and on the fi on the sixth day that. God created uh, uh, mankind in his own image and all that kind of thing. But what you you won't see in the Bible, of course, is any kind of mathematical basis for it. There, there is no formula in the Bible that creation, that C equals FT squared, that creation equals force of God uh, times time squared or anything like that. So in effect, um, the, the old traditions, the old dogmatic traditions of absolute truth, um, uh, were basically it came through in the in 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 storytelling, and with the scientific revolution, of course, it changed over into mathematical uh, principles. Um, what Newton did in his mathematical principles, he presented a general theory of movement and change, and its greatness is that it predicted the movement of all bodies in the universe, from falling apples to shooting stars. Now, later, Einstein and other physicists proved that Newton's theories did not always apply to the vastly large and the incredibly small, as we talked about on Wednesday. Um, but they also, but they did this through, with the use of mathematics. They didn't tell stories. They actually analyzed it through the language of math and came to the conclusion that Newton had gotten it slightly wrong. And if Newton had been alive in the 20th century and had the, the instrumentation uh, and mathematical tools that scientists in the 20th century had, Newton would have said, oh, well, what I've said is absolutely true forever, and you guys are wrong. No, he would have looked at their their analysis. He would have looked at their evidence. He would have looked at the math that they came up with, and Newton would have said, yeah, you're right. I'm wrong about uh, certain things. Some of my theory does not apply that. Um, so it's this idea of constantly questioning what exists and willingness to admit ignorance and willingness to go beyond what is known uh, currently. And one of the reasons why this scientific approach to understanding nature um, has become the dominant way we look at things. I mean, I know there are people who are still very religious and in this world, of course, and accept the truths that are in the Bible. But even religious people accept, most religious people accept the idea uh, that scientists, science has its own truths. And in fact, if you look at sort of the history of religion over the last four or 500 years as the scientific revolution has sort of taken hold, what's happened is that some of the old roles that religion played uh, in terms of explaining the natural world, have kind of given way to science. Now, religion still has a hold over people in terms of the moral code that it offers people and answering questions that are beyond science's ability to answer, like the big questions, of course, of why. Like, for example, why is there creation? Um, you know, science can't possibly answer that question of, you know, the sort of the ultimate question, why is there something instead of nothing? Um, science cannot answer that question. So religion still fills in there. Or, of course, what happens to us after we die? Well, you know, this, does our soul live on? These are things that science can't possibly answer. And so uh, religion uh, still supplies that. But in terms of explaining the, the, the how the natural world works, religion has largely given way to science. And the reason why is it's given away to science is because science just works. It works like, to, to state it as a sort of a, a paradox, it works like magic. You know, Newton laid out all of his theories of, 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 you know, of thermo, of, of physics, um, you know, a body will remain at rest or moving at constant velocity unless it is acted on by an unbalanced force. The force experienced by an object is proportional to its mass times the acceleration it experiences. If two bodies exert a force on one another, the forces are equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. And he laid them out in these formulas. The thing about Newton's laws is that when you actually applied them to the real world and you tried them out, they always proved correct. They always predicted what would 
would happen. And if something, if somebody tells you a formula and says, this will predict this, this will prove this happens, and you test it and you do it, and it, in fact, oh, wow, that force, that, that, that formula works, that, that mathematic works, you're going to come to accept it because the proof, as they say, is in the pudding, right? There it is. It's happening. It, 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 it works like magic. It really does predict. You know, you can look at objects in the sky. You can look at objects on Earth that are in motion, and you can explain where they're going to go next, where they're going to be in a certain period of time into the future. And when that, in fact, does occur, the science is proven, and you accept it. And that, in effect, is why science has ultimately, in terms of explaining the natural world, has displaced religion in most modern cultures. Now, while Newton's theories worked for the natural world, what about human society? Um, physics lends itself to this kind of mathematical formulation, right? Um, but other aspects of creation are so complex um, that such formulas are beyond our means to quantify. In other words, there's, there's, it's very difficult, for example, to develop simple laws of physics to explain, for example, human behavior, because it's just, it's so random and so chaotic that to figure out an all-encompassing formula is, is simply impossible to do. Um, but scientists who are trying to understand, for example, human society and how these sort of complex things uh, 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 that were seemingly chaotic, uh, that defied simple theory, they did not really, they did not give up on math. They also applied math. Uh, they also followed in the Newtonian tradition of trying to explain reality in terms of forma, uh, formulaic, formulas based on mathematics. And, and that's where we get the science of statistics, which emerges really uh, a couple of cent, about a century after Newton. Um, but again, um, you know, sort of takes this idea that we can explain reality in mathematical ways. And I'll tell you, this relates to a, a, a relatively unknown story that goes back to Scotland in the 1740s. So in, in, in the 1740s, um, there were a couple of clergymen. They were officials in the Church of Scotland, and they were trying to set up a, a life insurance fund for widows and orphans of dead clergymen. Um, in other words, they were trying to figure out a way to put aside enough money that the interest derived from this money would support the widows and orphans of, uh, of, of clergymen who had passed away the, the church. In other words, the church felt it had a duty to take care of these widows and orphans when uh, the clergy of the Church of Scotland had died. But the question was, is how much would each clergyman need to set aside? In other words, they were going to have the clergyman set aside a part of their salary into this fund in order that they would create a large enough fund that they could pay off, pay a uh, uh, dividends to the widows and orphans after various clergymen had died. And they had to know, for example, so they, they, they decided to approach it in a scientific way. And they, they went about it. They, they had to know how many clergy would die each year, how many widows and orphans they had, and how much longer the widows and orphans would outlive their husbands, and how long till the orphans grew up to be adults and therefore no longer needed the funds to support them. They could support themselves. So f first, let's discuss what they did not do. So these, these, these they are trying to come up with a with an a way to figure out how much money do we need to have every clergyman set aside into this fund to support the widows and orphans. And in a pre scientific revolution, what they would have done was they would have prayed to God for answers, uh, or they would have looked for the answers in Scripture. Okay, what does the Bible say about this? Or or, or, or you know or or let's pray to God and and we'll get the answers that way. But what instead what these two clergymen did, being products of the scientific revolution themselves, and they said, no, let us contract a mathematician um, to develop a formula. So what they did was they gathered a huge amount of data, and they put the, and they, and, and they put the data through a mathematical formula and came up with a figure. Uh, uh, altogether, they said that the clergymen of the Church of Scotland would have to deposit 58,348 pounds into the fund. And when they paid out the money by year's end, in other words, they had the, 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 the clergyman, the, the existing, the living clergyman, put money into a fund that would then be paid out to the various widows and orphans of, of clergymen who died. And they and this mathemat and they develop this scientist this mathematician developed this formula to 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 how much each of the clergymen would have to contribute, the living clergyman would have to contribute. They came to the fact they came to a figure of fifty eight thousand three hundred and forty eight pounds, and when they paid out the money by the end of the year, they found out that that 
particular formula had been absolutely exactly right. It had been within a couple of pounds of what was needed. And so the idea was that, you know, the Bible, of course, is filled with all kinds of prophets predicting the future, predicting what's going to happen. But here was a prediction that was dead on, absolutely spot on. And it came from a mathematical formula. It came from this idea, this new science of statistics. And by the way, the Scottish Widows Fund still exists today. Um, it, of course, it's, pl it's now something that the larger British public uh, can participate in, and it handles roughly $100 billion in assets today, and is one of the largest pension and insurance companies in the world. So clearly the idea worked, and it lasted. Um, and these statistical models, uh, beginning with this Scottish Widows and Orphans Fund, proved to be the language of many sciences, from biology to demographics to economics to psychology and on and on. Um, and this, this, this idea that the use of mathematics does not just explain the natural world, but can explain human society and can explain very complicated, um, very complicated uh, 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 systems like the biology of the human body is one of the legacies of, of this idea, starting with Newton, that mathematics can explain reality, can provide uh, uh, can provide the data that we need to understand how the natural world works and even how human society works. Things, incredibly complex systems that a simple formula that Newton came up with for physics that by amassing a lot of data, a lot of mathematical data, you can make similar predictions about the behavior of biological organisms or about the behavior of human institutions that are as accurate as Newton's theoretical uh, uh, formulas for uh, physics. Now, most people today do not understand science because they don't understand mathematical language. You can count me among them. In 1620, Francis Bacon published Novo Organum, as we talked about, argued that knowledge is power. Uh, the real test of knowledge, he argued, is not whether it is true, but whether it empower it is is that it, it be true, but also that it empowers us. Um, the, he argued that, as we talked about the two sort of applied science and theoretical science, that the real test of science is utility. If a theory allows us to do things, as in the case of moving an obelisk, uh, that is true knowledge. Um, the scientific revolution allowed for two kinds of tools, mental ones, such as economic theories or statistical theories or the laws of physics. And even more important is it has allowed us technological tools. In fact, today we tend to, we kind of blur technology and science together because the two are so wedded since the scientific revolution. But prior to the scientific revolution, science and technology, and even after the scientific revolution began, um, science and technology were considered two very separate things. Um, Bacon sort of tried to connect the two uh, by talking about science as both discovery and as an applied thing, as a utility. Um, but it took a while for this connection to be made, that theoretical science could lead to technological innovation. Even as late as 1800, rulers you know, of countries, uh, political leaders, business leaders, did not finance research into physics or biology or economics because no one saw that 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 scientific theory could be applied to the real world and make for real change that would change people's ability to manipulate the environment and, of course, then, you know, gain power through that. Um, it took the welding of science and technology of the Industrial Revolution to create this marriage. And from the other side, most thinkers did not try to use what they had discovered to build new technologies. Scientists were sort of these theoretical people, and they sort of accepted, uh, you know, they, they developed that sort of the theoretical side and didn't really look to use that scientific theory to improve technology. If there were technological improvements, it generally came from craftsmen, not theorists. So building upon existing knowledge and improving things incrementally, little by little. And government really didn't get involved. Today, government brings in all kinds of scientists for all kinds of reasons. But prior to 1800 and the Industrial Revolution, um, really, for the most part, uh, governments really didn't get involved in funding scientific research because, again, they did not see that this theory would lead to anything practical. It was good to know more about the universe, but the idea that this could then be used to manipulate the universe or manipulate the natural world to serve human interests, that was something a little bit slower in coming. Now, obviously, uh, throughout human history, there have been technological advances that have led to historical uh, 
you know, they led to historical events. For example, going all the way back to 1500 BC, uh, when the Hittite peoples came into the Middle East and conquered much of the Middle East, including the ancient kingdom of, of, of Egypt, it was because they had this wonderful new technology known as iron weapons. But these, these technological developments were rather rare prior to 1800 AD. Um, they came along every once in a while, and they certainly weren't the product of, the, you know, the, the, the leaders of the Hittites did not sort of say, oh, we need to fund scientific research into iron smelting because that, may, you know, because that will lead to, to uh, innovation that will give us an advantage over our enemies. That, that wouldn't have even crossed their mind, as, of course, in today's world where, you know, advances in weaponry are heavily funded by the government because the idea is that, and even theoretical stuff is, fi even theoretical science is financed by the government because it believes that it will give that particular government an edge over competing governments uh, in weaponry and in other things and in technology. So there's a lot of funding today. But again, this is something more typically, more typically what, what led to one civilization conquering or another was simple organizational tactics. Uh, you take the Roman Empire, for example. Its army was the best of its day, yet technologically speaking, it had no... It had no technological advantage over most of its enemies, but it did have discipline. It had an efficient organization. It had huge manpower reserves, um, and and that's what allowed the Romans to to conquer much of the known Western world. It was not some great new technology that they had. Um, the Mongols, for example, conquered China, and in fact, China had a higher level of technology than the Mongols, but the Mongols had better organization and better military tactics and better horsemanship, and that's why they were able to conquer a much more technologically advanced civilization like the Chinese in the, in the 1200s and 1300s AD. You know, the, Roman, the Romans fighting in, 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 you know, around the turn of the millennium back in the year zero, uh, you know, uh, could have fought 500 or even a thousand years in the future and still, and still been a credible enemy of any army in the year 1000 or the year 1200. Um, because, you know, this idea of applying science uh, to technological innovation to create new weaponry hadn't didn't exist yet, so there wasn't much change. Now imagine, for example, the last two hundred years. Imagine Napoleon's armies with their muskets and cannons trying to go up against the modern U.S. Army. Obviously, because we've invested so much in weapons, using scientific theory to develop all kinds of new weapons, the no Napoleon's army wouldn't stand a chance against the modern American army. Or take a generally a genuinely new technology, gunpowder. Right, the Chinese invented this. Uh, about 600 years ago, maybe a little earlier than that. Uh, no, not 600 years ago, but about 1,000 years ago. And, you know, the Chinese weren't, look, you know, they didn't, gunpowder was not developed as a weapon consciously by the Chinese government. Like, let's, let's invest in technology to develop this new thing that will give us an advantage over our enemies. In fact, gunpowder was actually an accidental uh, creation of, of, early uh, Chinese scientists or alchemists, you know, people who believed in sort of transforming matter uh, through magical means. And they were looking actually for an elixir of life. They were looking for something that would bring eternal youth. And they came across and they developed this, this formula for gunpowder. But in China, it was never really used for much beyond firecrackers and fireworks. Um, even, even when the Song dynasty was facing their Mongol empire, uh, um, uh, uh, their Mo the Mongol invasion in the 13th century, the Chinese government didn't think to use this new technology. It was just beyond the ken of people before the scientific revolution and the application of scientific theory to technology that that was even possible. In fact, and, and so it's not surprising. And so in effect, uh, the, science the, the, sci the Chinese never used gunpowder as weaponry. It was, it was when gunpowder was moved to the to, to, to Middle East and to Europe that it was first utilized uh, as weaponry. But the Chinese themselves, who invented it, didn't even think to use it that way because it was just beyond the idea of most people to use technological, to use scientific theories and new scientific developments and apply them in ways uh, and apply them technologically. The Chinese government didn't even dawn on it to... to, to and what this comes down to is, again, to get back to that whole point, that until the scientific revolution and then the industrial revolution, which created the idea of using scientific theory to develop new technology, humanity, for the most part, did not believe in progress, something that is so much a part of our modern lives. They, they simply didn't. Um, people generally thought that, you know, imagine some kind of golden age when everything worked really well in the past, and they longed for that. But they, the idea that they thought they can use scientific understanding and new developments and technology to bring about a new golden age never dawned on people. 
um, you know, they've, you know, people kind of had this idea that if, if, if the great figures of the past, Buddha or Confucius or Jesus or Muhammad, um, had not been able to deal with basic human problems in their time, um, how could modern human beings who are so much uh, less capable than these great prophets of the past, uh, how could we do it? How could human beings living today be able to do it? It's just believed as impossible. And in fact, in many cultures, um, there was this idea that just the very idea of striving to use technology and new ideas to um, affect change, to create greater command and greater mastery of the universe, generally in, 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 in the stories and things like the Bible and Greek mythology, when human beings do try to do that, God strikes them down because it is it is not something that human beings should even attempt. Uh, the idea of progress, scripture and myth says it's not possible and it's even undesirable. Uh, of course, in the story in the Old Testament, the story of Babel, when when human beings decide they're going to be able to ta they want to that be, human beings are going to get to heaven uh, not through whatever scripture says, but are actually going to build a tower uh, to to reach heaven. What does God do? He not only destroys the tower, but he inflicts on humanity, the babble of languages, um, so that human beings will never be able to cooperate in that way and will never be able to build such a tower in the future. Or you think of the Greek myth of Icarus, where uh, Icarus and uh, his father Daedalus, um, you know, Daedalus creates these wings that allow him and, and his son to escape from the labyrinth uh, in the Greek myth. Um, what happens is Icarus uh, is so proud of this technological achievement, this ability that he now has to be able to fly by using this technology that his father's developed. Of course, what does he do? His his pride and his hubris and his desire and his his the fact that he thinks that he is now invincible. Of course, he flies too close to the sun. The the wax that holds the feathers together melts, and he falls dead to earth, and he falls to earth and dies. So the idea again that using technology to conquer the natural world is actually frowned upon in myth and in scripture. And, and even take the the ultimate the ultimate effort to overcome the limitations of the natural using technology to overcome it, and that is of course the ability to overcome death itself, right? So for those of you, some of you may be familiar with the Epic of Gilgamesh, which of course is the first great literary epic that humanity has ever created that has survived to the modern day. And the story, there's many elements to the story of Gilgamesh, right? It goes back to ancient Sumer 2,500, uh, excuse me, 3,000 years ago. Um, Gilgamesh is a powerful king in the prime of life and he sees his best friend and Kaidu die. Um, so, you know, he, he, as he sees his, his best friend die and he's watching the, 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 the man's body, his friend's body. And, you know, and he sees kind of, uh, he sees the body begin to decay in front of him. Worms start to grow out of the dead body. And he's absolutely horrified by this. And Gilgamesh decides he's going to do something about it. And he goes on a great journey, um, in search of an answer to death. Um, and, and to find a way to defeat Beth. And he goes in much of the, the tale of Gilgamesh is this, this epic journey that he undertakes. Um, and, and he even goes into the underworld to try to find out the answer to how to overcome death. And of course, we all know that in the end, of course, he, can, he finds no answer to it, right? That, that it is impossible to overcome death. And he comes to accept his own, his own mortality. Um, he, under, he comes to understand the idea that when God, when the gods created humanity, they, they, made humans mortal. They made humans die. And that is just the fate of all human beings. But think about today, right? And, and here's the, um, this is the frame. Here's the Epic of Gilgamesh um, seeking to conquer death. Um, and, and, and here it is written down and there he is depicted in an ancient Sumerian uh, sculpture. But the death is not conquerable. Right, that, that Gilgamesh's understanding of that and humanity's understanding of that, of that idea that we are mortal, of course. Um, but do we feel that way today? That that's kind of the interesting thing. Since this combination of of the scientific revolution developing this idea of of this idea of progress that we can understand the universe in a better way, and then in the last couple of hundred years since the industrial revolution, which something we'll talk about later in the course, this idea that we can apply this new theory uh, and and apply it to technology to make things better is something that we have you know really come to uh, accept in the modern uh, world, and um, 
the idea is that, you know, in today's world, we, we simply don't accept death. Um, you know, we see death in the modern world in a way that people before the scientific revolution and, and before the idea of applying scientific theory to technological development uh, came about um, would never have thought of. Uh, for example, you know, we, we think that when you get sick, you know, if you have a sickness, you go to, you apply science, right? You, you use science, you use modern medicine to try to overcome death. Death becomes kind of a technical problem, a heart valve that doesn't, that goes kaplooey or a cell that begins to run amok and reproduce itself wildly causing cancer or an infection caused by bacteria. We don't just sort of take our fate and say, okay, that's the way it's going to be. We turn to science. And, and while we still can't overcome death, um, but we haven't given up on it. We, 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 we spend hundreds of billions of dollars every year on scientific research in an effort to overcome death because we think it is possible. Uh, this is something new, right? We believe that we can, we can defeat it. Uh, and of course, people, and, and, and the proof is in the pudding again because science keeps coming up with new, new ways of defeating death, uh, if not permanently, of course, at least putting it off, right? It can, we, we, we've developed enormous uh, tools to fight off cancer now, uh, to, to extend the life of our hearts, to do all kinds of things to keep uh, death going. Um, so, um, and the proof is there, because if you look at the history of medicine, there has been unbelievable progress um, to the point where you know, things that killed off people in the past no longer really. For example, just take these two things I show here on this slide from 800 years, 800 years uh, I'm sorry, 700 years apart. So in, in 1199, uh, King Richard the Lionheart was struck by an arrow in his left shoulder um, during the Crusades when the Christians were trying to reconquer the Holy Land from the Muslims in, in the Crusades. And he was struck by an arrow in his left shoulder. Today, that would have been merely a flesh wound. But um, it turned gangrenous, right? It, it got, he got gangrene and he died. And 600 years later, in the, in the age of the American Civil War, something we'll be talking about later on in the course, the same thing applied. You know, if somebody got shot uh, in the arm, the only thing that people could do in the Civil War, even though it's 700 years apart here, the only thing they could they could do was to cut off the arm uh, to prevent gangrene from, from setting in and killing the patient. So, you know, in 700 years, almost no progress. But if you then jump just simply 50 years ahead to World War I, um, by that time, there was an understanding of germ theory. There was an understanding of sepsis or, 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 or you know, the, the, the contamination of wounds. And in, by the time World War I, just 50 years after the Civil War, uh, gangrene was no longer the problem it was, and bullet wounds could be treated in, a, in an antiseptic way um, and saving people's limbs that once killed people. Even And here, it's just over 700 years, almost no progress whatsoever, and then science has brought about this amazing progress just in the 50 years between the Civil War and World War II. So earlier on in on Wednesday's lecture, I talked about how the, the three great revolutions in human history, and I want to leave with this point. Um, revolution one, of course, the, the cognitive revolution that sort of got us uh, the ability to imagine and the ability to think abstractly that sort of begins our, 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 our ability to, to move ourselves forward uh, beyond just sort of evolutionary and genetic change. Then, of course, the agricultural revolution that gives us the ability to um, develop civilization to sort of accelerate history. And then, of course, the scientific revolution, which allows us to both understand the natural world and then to achieve a, a, a great deal of mastery over it. Um, and then I sort of talked about where is the scientific revolution leading because we're still in the midst of it. And I would argue perhaps this is sort of speculative. And we can sort of think about it this way. But, you know, we are – science is busily moving towards – the idea of conquering death itself. I mean, scientists won't talk about it in those terms because it's too speculative and it's, you know, it's, it sounds too crazy to most people, but that is really where science is moving. The idea that we can conquer death itself. And if we look at the progress over the last two, 200 years, um, and, and just realize the amazing progress it has made since just the civil war, 150 years ago, uh, in terms of, of helping people survive things that used to kill them. Uh, the, the abilities have just 
not only have they are they monumental uh, in terms of conquering death, but they are accelerating. Every year, they seem to be moving faster and faster. We have genetic engineering, nanotechnology, replacement parts for the human body. Um, some people even refer back to uh, some of these genetic experiments. Uh, some people refer to them as sort of the, uh, the Gilgamesh project. Uh, in other words, you know, they're, they're kind of a modern quest to do what Gilgamesh was trying to do 3,000 years ago in the epic of, tr uh, 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 excuse me, like 3,000 years ago. 4,500 years ago, back in the year 2,500 BC, when the Epic of Gilgamesh was first, you know, first came forth, um, you know, he was trying to find an answer to death and sort of, it, sort of a lot of this modern experimentation kind of overcoming death um, is a sort of a similar quest, but using modern scientific principles. Um, and, and we've come to believe, we live in a technical age. Our belief today is that we, if we just leave scientists to themselves, you know, they will solve all of our problems. They will create a heaven on earth. They will create bliss and abundance and godlike powers and even immortality. And because look what they've done so far. You know, we all live lives that are infinitely uh, richer, particularly if we live in a wealthy society like the United States, than people in history lived in. You know, our children don't die in, in, in childbirth or in youth anymore the way they used to. We live much longer lives. We have much healthier lives. We have all kinds of godlike abilities over nature now. You know, we can we can jet around the world. We can, you know, uh, we can watch images from all over the world. We can store all this information on our e-readers. I mean, just it, all that stuff I talked about at the beginning of Wednesday is just is really quite astonishing. Um, so, you know, we have come really far. Um, that, But in a sense, this scientific advances doesn't just depend on scientific theory, of course. It's shaped by economic, political um and even religious interests, you know, for example, there's much debate about whether we should do research on embryos or whether even some of these projects to overcome death or even do fit into our moral and religious traditions. But we are investing huge amounts of money in it, and that's what makes modern science work. Um, and that's what it's made it work for the last few hundred years. It's not just theory, but it's it's throwing money at it and throwing resources at it because it pays off in the end, right? You, you develop new technologies, new, new new theories, new technologies, and they create greater wealth, which can then be funneled back into developing new theories and new ideas. Modern science is really expensive and has achieved what it has because governments, foundations, the wealthy corporations are willing to finance it. This money has done more to help us understand the universe than any one genius or explorer. Um, if Columbus or Newton or Darwin had not existed, somebody else would have come up with their ideas eventually or their achievements eventually, and probably not even that long afterwards because it was sort of these discoveries and these achievements were waiting to happen. You know, for example, Darwin's theory of evolution was reached roughly about the same time by a man named Alfred Ruff, Russell Wallace. Um, but... Well, these achievements and these discoveries and stuff are it kind of would have been achieved anyways, even without these great thinkers that somebody else would have come up with them. What wouldn't have happened is if there hadn't been money and resources thrown at them, then that then nothing would have happened. And that's what the modern society is all about is throwing these huge amounts of resources and money. That's really partly what the scientific revolution has brought, because as scientific theory proved itself to be true, as it proved to give mankind greater control over his environment and as that brought great returns to those who applied it in in in, in weaponry for example or in technology that led to greater profits uh, it kind of fed on itself and and the the, the wealth that those uh, innovations uh, brought forth were then reinvested to create new innovations and we're kind of on this constant virtuous cycle of development um, so all of these advances in medicine, um, have produced enormous and consequential results. And money and resources are the key. In the 1400s, for example, Prince Henry of Portugal funded much of the exploration the Portuguese achieved in that century in terms of establishing an all-sea route to the East Indies around uh, Cape of Good Hope in, in, in South Africa and, and to India and the East Indies that way, funded by the government. During the Cold War, for example, the American Soviet Union funded huge amounts of money, funneled huge amounts of money into nuclear physics and the space race that developed all kinds of new technologies. So it's, it's the application of resources. Now, individual science scientists themselves may think in terms of pure science, but they typically don't set the agenda, those with the money do. Indeed, when scientists ask for money, those with 
money ask, is this the most important thing to spend limited resources on? But these are not scientific questions. Scientists, science can explain how things work, what is out there, what might be in the future, but it cannot say what we should be in the future. That is the role of religion in ideology. In other words, science says we can discover this stuff, but um, what we choose to put our resources into is something that is usually typically decided by a society's moral code or by an ideology. Um, and I take two problems, for example. Uh, one scientist wants to study cow udders because he believes it might be possible to fight infections that limit milk production. Another scientist wants to study whether calves, baby cows, suffer from being separated from their mothers at birth. Now, each problem is important. Each is interesting, right? Um, both have to do with the way cows uh, are, are currently used in modern agriculture, right? Um, and But which will get the funding, right? So if the scientist interested in cow psychology could explain that separation anxiety limits milk production, well, then maybe he would get resources. But my point is, is that we tend to fund things that will lead to uh, that will lead to if, if it's corporate funding or even government funding that will lead to better milk production because that leads to profit. So it's a, it's choices that are made by society in terms of which way science goes. Scientists may have interests of all kinds, but they need the resources to do that, and those resources are oftentimes under the control of society at large or government or corporations rather than the scientists themselves. And so. Science cannot set its own priorities. You take genetics, for example. From a purely scientific point of view, what we do with our increasing understanding of it, cure cancer, cure depression, create a race of superhumans, maybe. Um, each, you know, if we think of, of, of different governments or different ideologies, you know, what would the Nazis do with genetics? Well, they would try to create a super race. Uh, what would co corporations do? They might use it to create uh, uh, things that, that, that people will want to buy. Um, if, you know, you, there's all kinds of ways that the direction science goes has very much, is very much controlled by those who control the resources. Um, and so if we want to understand where science has brought us in terms of as historians to understand the past, what we have to do is we have to look at what outside sources, what, excuse me, what outside forces, uh, ideology, government, corporations, business, whatever it is, why it has sent science in one direction and not another. And that, of course, is the subject that we've been grappling with uh, today. And that is, uh, you know, scientific theory is wonderful, but we know that a lot of times the application of science and the pursuit of science is determined by resources, and those are determined by larger forces. So I would leave you with this. Um, Science has brought us many things. It has brought us godlike powers, right? I mean, the ability to see across the world, to travel across the world in, day, in, in a matter of hours, to see across the world in real time. I and mean, these are powers that, that ancient people, people 500 years ago, would have seen as miraculous, as godlike. You know, we see as or ordinary stuff. Um, and as we look at current uh, uh, technological developments, particularly, for example, in the field of genetics, um, you know, what does it mean as genetics may allow us to conquer, it's possible that we may be able to conquer death itself, um, you know, that we may have amortality. In other words, you know, we may be able to create over the next few hundred years the ability so that we, we, we don't die from disease, we don't die from the decay of our bodies. I mean, if you think that's impossible, just think what we've achieved in the last 100 years or 150 years since the Civil War war when medicine was pretty much at the same level it had been for thousands of years and suddenly in 150 years we've gone from that to this enormous this amazing ability to overcome disease and infection and all that sort of thing so where does this take us you know is the scientific revolution taking us to a new level of human development to the point where maybe we're not even humans anymore if, if we achieve an ability to overcome death then we're not really humans anymore um, I began this, you know, this, this session of the course with a discussion of the three great revolutions in human history, the cognitive revolution, the agricultural revolution, and finally the scientific revolution. And in a sense, will the scientific, if, it, if the scientific revolution does lead to this conquest of death, um, will it sort of, in a sense, free us from history itself? In other words, so, so the cognitive revolution kind of begins history, right? We start to be able to, to, to change 
uh, are, are the conditions in which we live in a way that is not based on evolution or genetics, that it's simply, you know, we're able to manipulate our environment and manipulate our lives and manipulate things so that we can, you know, that we are no longer that progress is no longer, that our ability to move forward is no longer just tied to evolutionary change, but is, you know, something that we've, that we're able to forward on our own. Um, to the agricultural revolution, which kind of accelerates history, and we get civilization, and we get all the modern arts, and we get, and we get the, the ability to, 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 you know, conquer the natural world uh, that that gives us. And then, of course, it's the scientific revolution allowing us to escape history itself. So the cognitive revolution sort of begins history, the agricultural revolution accelerates it, and will the scientific revolution end it? Well, that's all very speculative, and we need to get back to history itself. And what we're going to take a look at is, in you know, I've talked about how the course is going to be the first uh, five or six weeks of the course are kind of the age of revolution. And we're now going to, we've looked at, a, you know, uh, uh, the scientific revolution. And the next thing I want to sort of take a look at is the capitalist revolution, how it changes uh, the economics of the world. And so to that, we will turn next week. So thank you for listening. And now please, uh, the next frame will show you the quiz. Please take this quiz and send in your answers via email to me, and they are to be in by Monday. Thanks, and see you on Monday. Well, there it is.